Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger and Brian Broom. It's the usual cast of characters back again. It feels like it's been a while. Maybe it's only been two weeks, but it feels like a while. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We talked last week, we began our series on the walls of the city we we talked about biblical theology because this is a little bit of a focused deep dive into walls as a concept. Um, so we talked about what we're even doing with biblical theology. What's the point of that? And we talked about the nature of walls in the ancient city to the pagan mind. And we talked about the Garden of Eden a little bit. So what's next? Well, we did talk briefly about the city of Enoch, which was the mm-hmm. city that Cain mm-hmm. built having tried to invent his own religion and murdered his brother in terms of it, which is the way of the city of man. And we talked a little bit about- I feel like I've heard that story before. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And we talked about Babel, Babylon, um, the tower whose top was to be in heaven, and how mankind tried to define himself, give himself a name, an identity in terms of that. And again, there were walls- uh, what the walls were there for, besides defining the community, the, the Bible doesn't say, because presumably all of humanity was there. I never thought of that till now. Maybe to keep out the dinosaurs and dragons and such. <laughs> but, uh, or maybe it's just something buried deep in the human subconscious that says we need definition, we need defense, we need to draw a circle and say we are in the inside and everything else is outside. It's funny, even organizationally, you know, if you have one big drawer, Mm -hmm. it's more likely to become a junk drawer than if you have the space broken up into little compartments. Mm -hmm. It is something about the way God has rigged our minds to work. We want to know what does and doesn't belong, what is and isn't mine. We come then, I suppose, to Abram, who's called away from a land full of cities and archaeology like History, we're told, begins in Sumer. We, we know about... The... Okay, Gretchen's waving at me, and it's extremely <laughs> cute, but I will continue on. And no need to slice that out, because everyone wants to know what Gretchen's doing right now. Um, the, uh, the Fertile Crescent was full of city-states, each built around a ziggurat, tower to heaven, an imitation of Babel. God calls Abraham away from all of that, and and although we're not told in Genesis, the writer of Hebrews says that he was called out to look for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And I remember as a small child sitting in chapel at school and hearing that verse read, and the speaker did not explain it, and I don't know what in the world, the, the message or sermon was about. I just remember hearing that and thinking, wait, something's going on here. Foundations. Doesn't the Bible call Jesus a foundation or something like that? Mm. That's all I remember. Mm. No one ever explained it. Uh, and I don't know how many people have ever had it explained. I, I assume the, the common assumption is that the writer's talking about heaven or the new Jerusalem beyond the resurrection, a literal physical city God will build. That's There's some truth in both of those, but that's not really what's going on there. Those are, are um, things that fall out in the process. Uh, what Abraham was looking for was something he could not find in this world. He, he wasn't looking for a pre-made, prefab city that was over the next rise or around the next hill. What he was looking for was in the future, and he knew that. Uh, when I ask my students, what is the nature of a city, they will tell me all sorts of things, and generally we have good discussions. But the first word that comes to their minds, I'll tell you, is not community. Mm. Because our cities are not places of community anymore. But once no. upon a time, they were. Mm-hmm. And community is inevitably religious. The ancient world knew that. Um, and again, Emily, you can supply the name of the author of The Ancient City. Oh, Fustel de Coulanges. De Coulanges. Okay, I'm going to get that someday. Uh, he goes at length to argue, and as far as they know, he's not a Christian. Maybe he is, and I don't, just don't know it. He goes out of his way to argue that the ancient city was inevitably a religious institution. It was founded around a central temple, founded 
by magic in terms of the dead ancestor buried there and that you belong by belonging to that religion. And if you didn't belong to that religion, you didn't belong to that city. You were an outsider, alien, and so on. Our modern secularized world would like to pretend that that's not the case, that you don't need a religion, that mere common freeway system and supermarkets, <laughs> if we have those anymore, are enough to pull people together and as long as everyone's obeying the traffic laws and not robbing the st stop and shop, um, th that's good enough to constitute a community. Added a public school and county officials who um, interfere with your business, and you pretty well have a community. <laughs> Ironically, in some <laughs> of our cities, you can just stop and rob the stop and shop, <laughs> and uh, they call it a sanctuary city. <laughs> yes, yes. Sanctuary from what and for what? The the ancient world was honest. They knew who their gods were. Mm -hmm. And when they went to war with another city, their gods went to war with the gods of that city. Uh, this this was this is what was taken for granted. Abraham abandoned Ur of the Chaldees, a city dedicated to the moon goddess, and went out away from any kind of organized city. He was looking for a city, but it was one he would not find in his lifetime, and he knew that. The uh, other New Testament writers, Paul in Romans 4, says the promise to Abraham was that he would be heir of the world. Mm. Now, you can read, again, you can read Genesis, and you won't find that expression, but Paul takes it as obvious. What well, we are told, um, the gospel that was preached to Abraham was in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Mm-hmm. All the families. So that's what he was looking for, a community to find in terms of faith in God's promise to bring the Messiah into the world to save people and to bless the nations. And Paul in Galatians 3, and we've, we've looked at this before, spends a lot of time arguing that blessing means justification and sanctification, the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that this is the, the heart, the, the, the center of all the blessing that God intends for his people and for all nations, and thus the world. So that's the kind of city uh, Abraham was looking for. Now, when you have people whose hearts are dedicated to Jesus Christ, to the Messiah, they're going to live a certain way. They're going to uh, submit to his lordship in all of their laws and culture and customs and traditions and all of that. And, and that's the kind of thing Abraham was hoping to see. Beginning in this world, he was already building in the suburbs of the New Jerusalem when he won followers along the way and had all those homeborn servants who hung out with him, and he made friends with the local sheiks and got them onto his side, apparently religiously as well as militarily. And yet he knew that until Messiah came, until the seed came, this, this work would not be done. And so he waited. He waited in the land that was his by promise, but where he never inherited anything more than some land he bought for a supplicator for his family. And the, we could spend, we won't unless you want to, a um, good deal of time in Hebrews 11 looking at these all died in faith not having received the promise. The writer goes through um, everyone from Abel down through Abraham and Jacob and Isaac and says, they, they all were looking for this heavenly city. They were looking for something that comes out of heaven, out of God's grace, out of God's sovereign power, but is a presence here and is eternal and thus survives the judgment and the resurrection, but has its beginnings here. And uh, it's in this context now we come back to walls. Because this city does have walls. And when we see it in, in vision in Revelation 21 and 22, there are walls. The people who are inside belong to the city. Strange, that. <laughs> uh, and the city, and at the center of the city is the temple, who, which is no longer a building, but it's the Lamb and, and God himself. And we are told in the final warnings that there are those who are outside, uh, dogs and whoremongers and idolaters and murderers, whoever loves and, and cherishes a lie. So there's an inside and there's an outside, but the focus is ethical now, covenantal. It's not genetic. It's not who your parents were, where you were born, or what shape your eyes or nose are, or the color of your skin, or anything like that. It's your relationship with Jesus Christ. So without are those who have given themselves to sin, and yet in John's vision, the gates are open, and there are angels, messengers, calling people still to come in, and the Spirit and the Bride say, come, and mm -hmm. let him that is a thirst come. 
whosoever hears, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. Well, that's to jump ahead, but historically this unfolds. So we have Abraham, promised land. That's it. It's a land. It's promised. It's going to be his along with the whole world, but not much happens. And for the next 430 years, we don't get much further. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob set up altars when God appears to them. Uh, Bethel seems to have been some kind of sanctuary place, but we're never told if they built a tent or a house or anything there. Um, we're just altars and groves are about all we get. And so on until Israel's taken down into Egypt in the days of Joseph and are there for a good long while. And they come out, and then finally at Sinai, God introduces walls. It's called a tabernacle, mm -hmm. a tent. And God's going to manifest his presence inside this tent. And where he's going to manifest his presence, his glory, that's shut, uh, shut off by a curtain, a veil, a wall, curtain wall. And the room outside of that also has its curtain. And only the high priest can go into the innermost sanctuary to God's presence in only once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The other room, the priest minister in daily, tending to the showbread and the lamps and the incense, uh, and splattering blood on veils and placing blood on the horns of the, of the altar within and, and such. They have, they have ongoing ministry. The Levites can't go in there. Neither can Israel, generally. And then we come to the courtyard. The courtyard has a wall. It's made of wood and cloth, linen. And Gentiles can't come in there. The God's people can come as far as the gate and the altar, which is the first piece of furniture. And there they surrender their sacrifice. They place their hands on its head and confess their sins. They kill it. And then they back off. And the priests do, maybe with the help of the Levites, depending where we are in history, um, they take care of finishing off the sacrifice. And you could eat there. Apparently, tables provided. You could eat your peace offerings, but you couldn't go any further. You couldn't go in into the uh, into the holy place, let alone the holy of holies. If you're a Gentile, you can't go in at all. And Gentile meant you had not been circumcised. You did not attend Passover. You were not a political member of Israel. You were not covenanted with God's people. So God fear you come to the very gate and people would take over for you. And that's, that happened. But the, that otherwise, there, there's an end there. And then beyond that lay the Holy Land. But it had borders. It didn't have walls. And so as we look at this, this border boundary wall thing, I, I suppose what we need to concentrate on is what was important to God what, how, what did he want, who did he want to keep out? Who did he want to invite in? And on what terms was any of this possible? Yeah, it's interesting that the nation of Israel, as you mentioned, politically had such a defined in and out um, in the sign of the covenant. Um, in circumcision, it was very clear who was Israelite, who was worshiping mm. God as a member of this covenant. So the walls would have been you know, symbolically unnecessary mm -hmm. as far as people are concerned. Um, there's clearly, as you were saying, God decided what mattered, what was in and out, and ge geography wasn't wasn't on the list. <laughs> Although uh, I do find it funny what someone uh, said uh, about a week ago, <clears throat> excuse me, talking about circumcision and how do you determine that someone is circumcised before they enter the temple? Is it just like, <laughs> all right, before you can come in, you've got to drop your drawers, you know, sh sh drop your drawers and uh, prove it. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, I imagine there was uh, probably some more familiarity among uh, the members of, uh, of Israel, but there's still a lot of people. Um, but, but still, uh, even that kind of tongue-in-cheek observation aside, uh, it doesn't quite matter anything except that you were descended from Abraham, which obviously in the New, New Covenant, it matters that you are descended of Abraham 
by means of faith, um, which even further eradicates the physical location mattering. That was a long ramble, but I got somewhere, <laughs> I think. <laughs> but you have to think about the the community, right? Where, you know, how do we, we don't check if somebody's baptized before they take the, before they take the Lord's Supper in our churches today. But with, with caveats Lutherans for how mad. mobile society <laughs> is today, like if there's a kid who's grown up in your church, there are probably people in that church who remember that kid's baptism, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's, there's a communal remembrance and I wonder how much that played into it. Probably a good deal. There were also the blue fringe fringes. Mm. Presumably once you were adopted into Israel by circumcision, you would then wear the blue fringe mm. uh, on your robes, which testified you were a child of heaven. Mm-hmm. And mm. presumably the local rabbis or Levites or whoever at the time knew the congregate knew their congregations, knew the law would say, wait. <laughs> Why are you wearing that blue stuff? You're not one of us. Um, so there would be there would be some outward significance, sort of dropping your torch, as you say. <laughs> uh, but you, you were talking about the, the baptism of children, but in truth, you have the same thing with the baptism of adults. What if oh, yes. the pastor <laughs> says, um, if you have if you are a baptized member of a Christian church in good standing, you believe that Jesus is your Savior, you may come to the Lord's Supper. I've been caught in the in that awkward position of, well, I think I was baptized. Here's my husband. He was baptized. He's not exactly a Christian, but you know, all of those kind of things that get difficult. And and so uh, I I don't know what your church does. Ours does a um or your churches. Our church does a general announcement, but then we also ask people who are visiting who we don't know. To, to slip out and speak to an elder. And, and basically, we ask that one question. It's sometimes a little stricter fencing to get people to look you in the eye and say, oh, yes, I'm a member of such and such a church. I've been baptized. I'm trusting Jesus. He's the Son of God. Welcome to the Lord's Supper. As opposed to, well, why are you asking? <laughs> How um, dare you? I am a Christian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get that sometimes. Yeah. So... There, there are still outward boundaries, but of course, the ones that matter most deeply are, as Brian said, faith in the God of Abraham, being a child of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, it's not to despise outward externals and ordinances that God has given us, but that's salvation is the wall that surrounds God's city, we're told in Isaiah. Now, um, looking at stepping back from it, looking at the promised land. In, in the days of the judges and the early days of the monarchy, insofar as God's people did what they were supposed to, which wasn't often, <laughs> granted. But right. if they had, if they had, um, they would have had a free and prosperous society that was not supposed to discriminate against foreigners, immigrants, and such. If you wanted to come and live in Israel, you could. There were only a few restrictions. You had to leave your gods behind. At least if you brought them out in the open, you'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, You had to conform to the moral standards that God had set for all his people. There was to be one law for the immigrant as for those who were born in the land. Um, You could open up business. You could come to synagogue. You could come as far as the temple gate and and have the priest sacrifice for you. there were a couple things you couldn't do. You couldn't own agricultural land, at least for very long, and you couldn't hold political office until you became a covenanted member of Israel. But if Israel was what they were supposed to be, you're going to have a land that is relatively free. There's no tyrant who thinks he's God sitting on your throne. You're not going to be turned into a slave labor force. Uh, the government's not going to be interfering with your business and taxing you into non-existence. This is a place where there is liberty, and even liberty of conscience. No one forced you to worship Yahweh. You couldn't worship your idols. 
but you didn't have to profess a faith in a God you didn't know, didn't believe, but you would be confronted with his reality again and again. People would bear witness to that, and the very institutions would bear witness to that. So the borders were, in a sense, open. Now, before I go further, anybody gets worried. Is there a one-to-one -one correlation between Israel and the United <laughs> States today? No, for lots of reasons. Some of them are our own making. For instance, nobody came to Israel to get a free education for their kids because Israel didn't have a state-funded educational system. No one came to Israel to um, get um, welfare handouts because Israel didn't have that kind of welfare system. There was a gleaning system. You might be allowed, as Ruth was, to go into a field and glean, work really hard and earn some money. And there were no political sanctions against such a thing. In fact, political encouragement, in fact, uh, God's encouragement to let the stranger do that. But there was you didn't come thinking you were going to get free handouts. Mm -hmm. uh, and the kind of jobs you got, if you weren't skilled, then you'd be doing backbreaking labor for a while. Um, you also you, couldn't bring your drugs and peddle them. No, you couldn't do that. Or your idols, pornography, or... You know, there were there were certain things that did not were not supposed to come with you that you had to leave behind. You were subject to the laws of the land like everybody else. Uh, and if you were found guilty, you were not generally simply deported. You would probably be either forced to pay restitution or, as the case may be, executed, depending on the, the severity of your offense, because one law for everybody. So God had no walls on his country on in this political economic semi-paradise had it worked the way it was supposed to, which it didn't. <laughs> had people not been sinful. Had people not been things. sinful and <laughs> continually rebelled against God. Uh, but yeah, just that, that minor setback. Yeah. Minor setback. <laughs> of course, we don't deal with that today. Yeah, it's not like we're any no, better we, than people they People are. are much better now. Uh, <laughs> I think we're all basically good, right? Yeah, we, we kind of better. evolved. We were dead in our sins, but we got better. <laughs> we got better. We, the Enlightenment helped us with that. And then there were... Romantic age really taught us to follow our hearts. And so we're all better mm -hmm. now. We all love everybody. And the government loves us most of all. Big Brother is watching mm -hmm. us. We will be assimilated. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, we've been down those roads before. Mm -hmm. But at the center of Israel, uh, spiritually at least and theologically, was the tabernacle. And again, foreigners could come to the gate and, and could offer sacrifices to the priest. But they did not partake of the feasts of Passover until they've been circumcised. So there's that boundary. It's a covenantal boundary. Being covenantal, it, it's, it's asking for and demanding spiritual faith and spiritual responses, but it also has an outward manifestation, uh, as, as sacramental things do. And that was the tabernacle, and then along comes Solomon, builds a temple, and it's bigger, and it's grander, and it has stone walls and more courts, and it's still the kind of same thing. Um, and during the days of the monarchy, we do begin to get a, a standing army, a royal guard of sorts, and sometimes it did police borders and chase down bandits. So... The idea of going after cartel lords with federal force is not foreign to scripture at all. But, uh, oh, I, but we need to go back because I lost this. Land. Yeah, land. Mm -hmm. The land was originally parceled out in the days of the conquest, and it was assigned to particular families. The only way uh, an outsider could come in and ever own land for any length of time was by being adopted into one of the existing families, at which point you became a family member, and you could inherit the land. Um, aside from that, if you came in, you could rent living space, lease living space. You could even theoretically lease agricultural lands, but never for more than 49 years, because in the 50th year, year of Jubilee, Jubilee. all lands reverted to the original owner. Mm -hmm. So if the Jubilee was 10 years off, then your maximum is... You could lease this land for 10 years. Maybe on the other side, you could try releasing it, but probably the owners, having now gotten fresh land, won't be too thrilled about that. Uh, as now, And also, as far as holding office, once you were a um, 
covenant member, you've been circumcised and you attended Passover, you could, in theory, hold office because you're an Israelite. But God stuck in some caveats or, or prohibitions or whatever the word is that means wait a bit. Mm. Uh, if you were an Egyptian or an Edomite, you had to wait three generations. If you were a Moabite, you had to wait 10 generations, and some read that as indefinitely, uh, because culture matters. Uh, they were not to be overly harsh on Egyptian culture because they'd lived in it and they knew what and they knew what was what that was like. And so, yeah, Edomites were brothers, sort of, so three generations. Ammonites, the Moabites, they were born out of an incestuous relationship way back before um, the Exodus. And God said, no, that's not, no, you don't want those people exercising rule in your city anytime soon or in your nation. So... It's interesting that uh, to draw a parallel with today's political discourse and the, uh-huh. the error that is sometimes made that American civil rights are human rights. Mm. That, you know, we believe in, you know, basically universal suffrage and uh, the right to property and all these things. But those rights are protected by our government. And Mm -hmm. our government simply does not have authority to defend those rights for other people. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Where the land ownership in Israel is not a human right. It's no. granted to specific families for the protection of the land, which is going to bring Messiah. Mm-hmm. I feel like I should have more thoughts, but that's what I end. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, I would dissent slightly, at the very least, uh, from what Emily just said. Uh, there Yay. are there are some there are some aspects of what the um, uh, United States government considers human rights uh, that I think are more universal. For instance, a right to self defense is definitely one of those. But we don't go invading other countries because they don't recognize their citizens' right to self defense. I suppose that's true. So you're, so you're talking about um, how our government should react to people in other countries. That it shouldn't be a universal policeman enforcing human rights everywhere. It's, it's, I'm, Are you I'm, asking I'm me? Not, yeah, I'm trying not oh, to put yeah. words in your mouth. Yeah. I'm trying to clarify. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's a summary. <laughs> okay. That's well, a fair yes, summary. that's fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> agreed. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, in the in the language of the United States, we we consider those rights given by God, right? Yeah. They're, they're not given by the United States government. And yet the job of the United States government recognizing those rights does not extend to jurisdiction over other people. Oh, yeah. No, then I would agree with that because yeah, okay. every every nation has been allotted a, a, an area <laughs> over which uh, God has given them authority. <laughs> Yeah. So we still have walls and borders. Sometimes they're to keep people out. Sometimes they're to keep people in. You all remember the Berlin Wall? Well, I don't uh, remember it, but I remember hearing about it. Oh, that's right. You're so much younger. I actually have a, I actually have a piece of it around here someplace from oh. the time I visited Berlin after Neat. shortly after the Wall had fallen. That's uh, pretty cool, actually. Yeah. Uh, but there was an attempt to keep people in paradise. It was rather mm-hmm. embarrassing. Yeah. Keep people, people would, from escaping from Why are you all East trying Berlin to escape into, paradise? To yeah. West Berlin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so the, the, now the during the Middle Ages, wall, or at the end of the Middle Ages, rather, walls began to be not such a big deal because of largely cannon, which could bring down walls. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um and then by the time we get to 1900, we have these things that fly mm. and can drop bombs on you. So walls actually at that point might be detrimental because they keep you from running. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so that's gone after a fashion, although walls on the southern border of the United States are still an issue. Uh, but here's the nature of covenant. Well, even even in the ancient world, walls 
could be turned against you if uh, somebody decided to sit oh, yeah. outside of them for <laughs> months on yeah. end. Yes, this is called uh, a siege. As happened in Israel a lot, <laughs> and rather spectacularly in eighty seventy. Yeah, when walls are, are no longer your friends, when your defenses become your own adversaries. Uh, the nature of covenant faith is to draw borders. Uh, I suppose the New Testament classic passage on this, at least one of them, is in Ephesians 2, where we're told about the, the middle wall of partition that separated Jew and Gentile in the Old Covenant and how that is abolished in Christ. He is our peace who hath made both one hath broken down the middle mm -hmm. wall of separation that was between us that was contrary to us. Colossians 2 says something similar. Uh, Christ's coming into this world was for all nations, to bless all nations. Mm -hmm. And and so the, the picture we get in Revelation is true. We have come into a community that is spiritual, it's covenantal. It has visible manifestations, but it cannot be reduced to any one of them. And so when people try to make uh, America the new Zion or Scotland or England or Russia or, you know, um, Western Europe during the Middle Ages, we, we go astray, sometimes horribly, uh, and, and yet we do acknowledge that nations that submit to Christ, families that submit to Christ, churches that submit to Christ, yes, there are churches that don't, uh, that these are manifestations of, of the covenant life that's in Christ, and, and that it's legitimate to, dr to draw boundaries and say, you know, we, we're, we're a Christian family. Mm -hmm. And we love to have you over, and you're invited to court my daughters if you're a Christian. <laughs> and you can come to our church, but if you start teaching things contrary to the gospel, we're probably going to ask you to leave. But that's divisive. Yes. The truth, truth divides. Is, truth divides. You know. uh, it also unites. And that's the other thing. The old saying a few generations back was, Truth divides, love unites, um, or doctrine divides and love unites. <laughs> uh, no, as far as Paul's concerned, uh, and you can hear Ephesians 4 is the classic passage. Uh, when Jesus ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to many. He made some pastors, apostles, prophets, teachers, for the work of the saints, the work of the ministry, for that finding the body of Christ. To we all come in the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God, to perfect men, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, God gave Bible teachers to unify the church because mm -hmm. we're unified by truth. And we, you know, you can be unified by being tossed into a leper colony. Eventually you're all going to get leprosy. <laughs> That's probably not the kind of unity you should want. And being tossed into a place where heresy reigns just so we can all be together and enjoy the heresy together is not what God has in mind for us. He wants us to believe the truth because he is truth. And, and so we're, as we talk about walls and we talk about coming to Christ and coming to God through Christ, we are talking about, we're using images that Jesus used. Uh, the, the way is straight and narrow. I am the way, the truth and the light. I'm the door. If any man will enter in, he must, um, by me, he, he will be saved. We'll get in and find pasture. Uh, so these, these are real things. Uh, Christianity, in some respects, is exceedingly narrow because it absolutely insists you have to come to God through Jesus Christ. But at the same time, it opens his arms to the world saying, but you can all come. This is an open invitation to everybody, to every people, every nation, every individual. It doesn't matter what your sins have been. You can find forgiveness. You can find cleansing. You can find new life. But you can't bring your sins and hang on to them. You can't hug them to your chest as you come through the gates of the New Jerusalem. Uh, the unity of the church, true love, stands in terms of truth and holiness. Mm -hmm. And there's there's many wonderful things that Francis Schaeffer wrote uh, along these lines. That's such a beautiful thing that we all come through Jesus. You know, I my group of friends in college, um, we tend to shorthand how we all know each other by saying, well, we all hung out at the same house. It was called Rivendell and that's <laughs> how we got to know each other. But really there was, there was something more about Rivendell and it wasn't until years later that one of my friends and I sort of sat down and thought, what, what was it? It was this one friend. It was like, if you, 
you kind of made it with this one friend and you knew you were, it's not like there was a really defined in and out because, you know, <laughs> hospitality is a thing and all this, but, but you really, the friendship was strong if you, if you were friends with this one person mm -hmm. and this person didn't even live at that house. He was just kind of the contact, <laughs> hmm, but kind of we have that in Jesus mm -hmm. where every single one of us in the kingdom of God knows Jesus. And that's such a, like, I've, you know, the six degrees of separation thing <laughs> in Jesus is, is too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know it's the a real one small who knows world. everybody else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, then next time we can come to Nehemiah Ooh, and we can yay. see about, yay, we'll find out the significance of him rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem after the captivity and how people standing on the walls of the city are suddenly automatically in the house of God and why that's important, what, how it brings us closer to Zion and to the coming of Christ. And so I think it's time for recommendations. <laughs> it is. It is. Brian, do you have one? <laughs> I have a great one. Um, it, it, I'm recommending a TV show. It mm -hmm. is one that I did not see growing up, but one that my wife grew up with and that we are currently watching through together, me for the first time, obviously. Um, it is the television adaptation of Brian Jake's Redwall. Oh, fun. I did another Wes one. Oh, yeah. Back, it's like, like a in 2001. Canadian, yeah. Huh. Um, it's really it's delightful. animated. There's in season two, Tim Curry voices Slagar the Fox, which is incredible. <laughs> he voices the villain. It's perfect. Yes. I realized it like in episode three. I don't know how I missed it in the first two. And I was like, that's Tim Curry. Yes. <laughs> but it's it's really good. Uh, see, so season one is obviously the first book, Red Wall, and then it's uh, Matt DiMeo, And then the third one is Martin the Warrior. And we're five episodes away from the end of that one now, I think. Uh, it's all really good. And like, it's kind of it's kind of funny because it like aired on, at least in the States, it aired on PBS. Mm -hmm. And so there's like, a lot of death happens in the Redwall books. Like characters oh, yeah. die constantly. There's blood it's and like, growing guts. <laughs> it's the it's it's nature, and nature is is Red full and of sin and, and death. Claw. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's really funny to watch it on the show because, like, you'll see the sword in this part of the frame, and it'll go out of frame, and you'll hear a thing go, eh, and then like it cuts, <laughs> and he's on the ground dead. There's no blood. <laughs> it's really funny. funny. Yeah, I was talking with our friend Sam Negus about Redwall and how like you start the series and it's like, oh, they have an abbey. They're monks. They're, they're like Christian mice. And then as the books go on and on, it's like, oh, they're praying to the seasons. <laughs> they're like, and how are they eating fish? Like that's, there are so many unanswered questions about this religion. <laughs> it's there very are, disturbing. <laughs> I think, especially in the earlier books, I, I like it because it's like, it's clear that Jakes wrote it and was like, this is going to be a medieval style world mm -hmm. where essentially God is so imminent that everything is, is holy in some sense. Um, and, and like, there's never any explicit miracle that happens necessarily, except like the main character hears the yeah, founding the and stuff. mouse they have visions yeah. and uh in martin the warrior like there's a, a random lady they meet in a forest who can prophesy and, oh yeah in, i forgot in verse uh, <laughs> of course <laughs> and um sidebar she also gives them oatmeal scones scones mm -hmm. for the americans yes. uh and I made oatmeal scones today as a result yeah, of watching yeah. that episode <laughs> yesterday. But um, yeah, it's it's such an interesting world to observe and, you know, whether you're reading it or watching the series to inhabit in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, because of that, it's it's this grounded, weirdly grounded for talking animals uh, <laughs> world that nonetheless has things that aren't just physical and it does it all without explicit like 
There's no Brandon Sanderson magic system where he pops out and goes like, by the way, you can do this and this will happen because of a magic system powered by the shard of a dead divinity or something, which is (laughs) a whole other side bar, but that's how he explains his magic systems. Um, And then, of course, like animals die and it like characters die constantly and you are like, oh, wow, I, I. was so distracted by cute animals abby that i (laughs) forgot that people die in this show (laughs) i have a question um because i have never read the redwall series although my girls did are do human beings have a place in this universe no No. there are no human beings Hmm. it is originally if you read the first book in isolation there's kind of a hint that what the animals are living in are kind of the vestiges of a human civilization. Mm. Um, But that's really not consistent. There's also a horse and dogs and not a raccoon, but a horse and dogs in the first book and they never ever appear again. (laughs) So it's wait there. There mm -hmm. that's right. There is. Yeah. So the sense of scale is way uh, off is very different in the first book compared to the rest because i don't think he was really planning on following like, up with an entire series the the the, the villainous rat Clooney <laughs> the scourge is like even in the episode uh, of the tv show is is riding a, a chariot being pulled mm-hmm. by a horse and they are roughly human to horse ratio size wise <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah. So either either rats and mice and all the other animals grew or the horses have shrunk. Who knows? It's a post-apocalyptic <laughs> thing. That's my theory. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, literally, it, what, it, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I'm going to recommend scrambled eggs. Mm. Gretchen didn't like the first time I made scrambled eggs because I made them the way I had them. All growing up, which was you have a hot pan, you pour the eggs in, you move them around and break them up until they're bone dry. That's scrambled eggs. Mm-hmm. And then I read this article on how James Bond likes his scrambled eggs, which is like <laughs> super slow and it takes forever because you start with like a cold pan and it it's it that's how Gretchen likes her eggs. <laughs> of course. Of course. Are, are you familiar with the show The Mentalist? I've heard of it, not watched it. I am. Um, I I don't remember much of it. Well, it's the ending as unsatisfactory as the ending of most series are. But as you come near the end, there is a point where the protagonist explains how to make scrambled eggs properly. (laughs) And apparently whoever wrote it had been watching James Bond Mm. because this is almost exactly the same thing. You cannot go too slow. You bring up the heat slowly. You don't heat it too fast. Yeah, that's not exactly how I do it, but burning them is right out. And um, (laughs) I I grew up with them being somewhat moist, but I found out my family does not like them that way at all. Mm -hmm. So I have learned to uh, not not dry them out to the point of, you know, being leather, but to go slow and make sure all the water is gone. Because there's a phrase in our family that brings up immediate retching. The phrase is egg juice. Ew. <laughs> I can understand that. <laughs> yeah, because when I was growing up, I, I didn't like them that way either. I always scrambled them hard. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I'm actually a convert now to uh, eggs over medium and sometimes mm-hmm. over easy, which I used to not like for whatever reason. But when you have like a scramble of potatoes and mushrooms, which I yeah. also used to not like, and bell peppers, mm-hmm. onion, garlic, and all that, and meat, yep. and then an over-easy egg on top of that mm. <clears throat> brings it together. Yeah. It's it's oh, so nice. Yeah. Yeah. i tell you what, eggs on toast make a lot more sense once yes. you've converted to the slow scramble. Oh, it's so good with duck eggs. It, we, mm-hmm. do, we do like some kind of hearty toast, uh-huh. um, butter, um, goat cheese, Oh. A jam, mm, yeah, and a over easy or over medium egg on top. Oh, it's so good. Mm, mm, eh, mm. <laughs> Making me hungry. Yeah, sorry. I have to go. I have to go fix dinner a minute, and that's not on the list. So, but maybe tomorrow. <laughs> um, I'm going to recommend recommendations. <laughs> 
<laughs> because we still aren't getting very many. We've got a few more, and our thanks to Gwen again for yes. sending us more recommendations. I, I was just able to glance over her list briefly. But thank you, Gwen, for mm-hmm. dropping a few more things on us. It is really uh, funny because like we obviously can see the the stats of like how many people are listening to our show. Mm-hmm. Um and you know the thing where like 10% of the students do 90% of the work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the exact percentage is, but uh, we have a lot of listeners who have not sent us recommendations yet. Just saying. Yeah. yeah and please don't, don't be afraid to recommend. Mm-hmm. I was talking to uh, to one young man. He said, well, recommend what? I mean, what do you want? You mean like like you recommend books? or Well, you do, f- do food a lot. Yeah, food, music. We got <laughs> off on that. A, a walk by the beach, um, giving your children middle names not, or giving them two middle names. I mean, there's all kinds of things <laughs> that that are out there that are recommend worthy. <laughs> yeah, that, that at least if give I have you a five spare minutes, what should I do with them? Yeah, there we go. Uh, and my impression is that of the people who do listen, a lot of people actually like this section particularly because mm-hmm. it's just. Christian's talking about ordinary fun stuff, which they may or may not get into. They may not like our books, yep. but yeah, probably along the way they think, yeah, that's not a very good book. What I would recommend is, yes, okay, that thing you would recommend, <laughs> send it to Tell us. us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't want to make eggs that way? How do you make them? Tell us. It'd be great. And coming up really, really soon, probably in the next three or four weeks, we're going to have to do um, that episode. So please, please recommend and Send us the recommendations. Yes. Don't just recommend them in your heart. <laughs> yes. Jesus might see those recommendations, but we won't. <laughs> we won't. Rest and we won't talk won't. about them. No. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Uh, thank you to our transcriptionist who donates her time to make transcriptions of the show available. If you'd like to get those in your email inbox... Uh, Look us up on Substack. That's where to get those. Um, Also look for us on your second favorite podcast catcher and let us know if we're not there. (laughs) Uh, Big thank you to our financial supporters. Uh, We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Uh, If you'd like to join their number, dear listener, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion or patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. And as always, send those recommendations and any other comments, questions, insults, bruquets, brickbats, halting towards Zion at gmail.com. That's what my mom would always say. Comments, questions, insults, bouquets, brickbats. Oh, bouquets. I thought you said, said something else and I did not know the word. Oh. Okay. If you want to send us bouquets, right. you can do that. I'm, I'm sure there's a way. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>